As we've been exploring this story, we've been talking about hunger. This is a story about hungry people looking for something to fill them up. Last week I said that perhaps one of the most important things we can do is to learn to sit with that hunger and trust it. Because if we try to fill it too quickly, we may end up trying to fill it with things that ultimately leave us empty. If you look at this story closely, you can see this happening. The crowds first ask Jesus what they need to do to perform the works of God, and then they ask him what works he is going to do so that they can believe him. But instead of answering either of those questions, Jesus instead talks about the work that God has done, the work of sending him the true bread from heaven. When they ask Jesus to give them this bread always, he instead talks about what the Father has already given him. Do you sense a theme here? The crowds are looking for the answer that they are expecting, the box to check off or the pill they can take or whatever so they can be saved, whatever it is they think they're hungry for. But Jesus instead keeps pointing to God. The crowds come looking to, for Jesus because they are hungry. They are so hungry that they fail to see that the bread of heaven, given for the life of the world, has already been provided. Now maybe I'm just cynical, but I feel like so much of what the church is and does centers around getting people to believe or to do or to say the right things. At least that's the perception of us in most of the world. The ultimate goal of our faith has become about assuring that we will be among those who will be raised up on the last day, that we will get into heaven when we die. But when I read this story, it almost seems that like the crowds, we've become so preoccupied with checking off the boxes that we fail to think, see that the thing that we most desperately want has been right in front of us the whole time. In the story, Jesus only ever testifies to what he, and by extension God, is already doing. With that in mind, I began to wonder, what if the ultimate resurrection, literal or otherwise, was the whole plan from the beginning? I don't mean that Jesus' action somehow made it possible, that he fixed what was broken in the fall. I mean, what if the resurrection is what God has been up to all along? What if Jesus didn't change anything, but simply pointed to what God was already doing? If, we all, if all we mean by salvation is life after death, what if that salvation has always been both universal and inevitable from the very beginning? I find that question interesting because I wonder how the church might be different if instead of getting people to do or think or say or believe what we think God wants them to, we actually just lived like God was already in control, already saving everyone and everything. What would that life look like? If we really believed that nothing we did could stand in the way of what God had already chosen to do, would we do anything differently? I can't help but notice that some people in this story start complaining. Those people are the Judeans, as St. John calls them. They're the folks who believe that the only way to be right with God is to follow the laws and the traditions of Moses the one who gave them the manna in the wilderness. They believe that failing to keep every letter of the law will result in divine punishment. Now, St. John says they start complaining, which is the same word that the book of Exodus uses to describe what their ancestors did when Moses led them out of slavery in Egypt. What's notable about this is that in spite of their constant complaining and ingratitude and falling short, 
God still brought the Israelites through the wilderness to the promised land. Not because they deserved it, because they'd earned the right to be there, but simply and only because God had already chosen to bring them to that destination. We've already seen Jesus draw the parallel between this story and that one. So what if we're meant to understand our lifespan on earth in the same way as the wilderness, where God was forming the people for what inevitably came next? We talk all the time about salvation as if it refers only to being raised on the last day, but even St. Paul occasionally talks about resurrection in ambiguous terms. In the book of Acts, he talks about resurrection for both the righteous and the unrighteous. These days, I'm beginning to wonder if salvation doesn't mean something else entirely, apart from the resurrection. I'm beginning to wonder if instead being saved means somehow getting, or if you prefer, believing, that God can and does save everyone simply because that's who God is. Because God couldn't do it any other way. Knowing that loving and resurrecting are the very nature of God, and that as God's creation, it is the very nature of everything created to love and to be resurrected, how does that change how we live? Does that open our minds or our hearts to a new and better way of existing in this world? Maybe salvation is finally being able to recognize God where God already is. In the story, the people who grumble against Jesus do so because they dispute the fact that he is, in fact, from heaven. I know this kid's parents, they say. I know where he came from, and it ain't heaven. The salvation in the story comes in somehow trusting that even though Jesus was born and raised in Nazareth, he also comes from God. If Jesus' humanity keeps us from recognizing God in him, it's worth pondering. Does our own humanity keep us from recognizing God in one another? Or even in ourselves. According to the sacred stories, we have been made in the image of God. We are the bearers of God's image, which is to say that we each bear something of God in all of us. That we are, in our deepest inmost selves, one with our Creator. Mostly our faults and our failures obscure this image cause us to hurt and to be hurt by one another and make us give in to mistrust and fear and condescension and even hatred for one another. But Jesus points us back to the reality that God has chosen to dwell in each of us. And because we are one with God, we are also one with one another. What if we lived like that were true? What would the world be like if we could look in the faces of the people around us, or even at our own face in the mirror, and see the creator of the universe staring back at us? We run around hunting for God in good deeds and in good people, in religions and faith practices and self-help books, working for the loaves that perish. But all the while, we can't see that God has, in fact, already done all of the work by coming to us. And not just to us, but in us. That God is alive in us. Maybe to recognize this is what it means to be saved. To see that the bread of life has already been given to us. As I think about what this might mean for us, how it might change how we are in the world, I start thinking about the church 
as a community of people who, having recognized the face of God in one another, decide to actually just love everyone around us with the love that God has first given us, regardless of whether or not we like them, whether or not they deserve it. When I read this text, I feel like Jesus is trying to get me, along with all these other doubters and seekers and hungerers, to wake up to what God is already doing, not to do something else myself. He's not trying to convince or coerce or threaten or cajole me into behaving a certain way or worshiping in a certain building. I feel like he's inviting me to believe, not in a particular faith tradition or a particular religion, but in him, in who he is, in the bread of life come down from heaven. Faith isn't about creed. It's about discipleship. Frederick Buechner wrote, If you want to know who you are apart from who you think you are, watch where your feet take you. And I believe the converse is also true. That where our feet takes us helps form us into who we are, into who we are becoming. And if where our feet take us is where God invites us to be, then God continues to form us into the people God is always creating us to be. I think that in this text, Jesus is inviting us to stop grumbling and arguing and defending what we think we already know and to simply come and see what he's all about. As people who know this story, we know that where Jesus is leading us takes us straight to the cross, to death but not just to any death. Because what Jesus does on the cross is not die, but live. He pours out his life, refuses to hold on to what was never his to begin with, and shows us in the most certain terms that in offering life for the world, he never has to worry about running out of it. We see this constantly in little ways, when we give of ourselves to help another, life flourishes. When we choose love over fear or hate or mistrust, life flourishes. It wells up like living water from a bottomless well. It rains down from heaven like manna in the wilderness. In the story, Jesus asks us to entrust our lives to that reality. And what's the sign that he gives to prove it? He is the sign, the living image of God, already living in each of us. The crowds followed Jesus across the Sea of Galilee because they were hungry. They ate their fill of the loaves and they wanted more. When Jesus told them about the food that endures for eternal life, they responded enthusiastically, Sir, give us this bread always. The crowd was hungry, hungry for a bread king, for a miracle worker, for a hu hungry for a spectacular God who could rain down bread from heaven. What Jesus says to them is that all these things they think they are hungry for won't fill them up, but he knows what can. Here I am, he says, you're looking at it. 